Right, so today's session is um, very special. Uh, for one, because uh, in the panel discussion today, we have two very eminent scholars on uh, sociological theory and political economy, discourses that are essential for understanding and envisaging our global South future in a post-pandemic situation. But this session is also very special personally for me uh, because those two eminent scholars also happen to be my oldest professors. Uh, Professor Anand Kumar and Professor Frank Welsh. Professor Kumar is a public intellectual and a sociologist in JNU, uh, from where he has now moved to the Nehru Memorial Museum and Library in New Delhi as a senior fellow. Uh, Professor Kumar is also my PhD supervisor. Uh, Professor Frank Welsh is a sociologist at the University of Innsbruck and uh, he was also the president of the European Sociological Association between 2015 and 2017. And it was his department at the University of Innsbruck where I made the first presentation of my research on the Indian migrants in Germany. So as I said, uh, this session is very special at both intellectual and personal levels. Welcome to Corona Conversations, Professor Kumar and Professor Welsh. Uh, this reminds me of our JNU days where, you know, we would uh, engage into long conversations on global <laughs> issues and local challenges. Uh, so I'm very thankful to both of you for being here today and for accepting the invitation to participate in the panel discussion. And we all are really looking forward to the session. Uh, before we formally begin, uh, like every other session, I'll quickly run through the structure of the session today. So uh, today's session is split between a panel discussion followed by an open house or uh, where the participants are invited to pose their questions and share their comments with the panelists. Uh, regarding the time split, the panel is about 40 minutes uh, and the open house is about 20 minutes. So it's roughly a one hour session. Uh, the panel discussion will be recorded like all other previous sessions and those recordings uh, will be available uh, at the GSSC website and open access. So uh, please do not re record or take pictures of any portion of the panel discussion. As I said, there will be open access available later at the GSSC website. Uh, now regarding interacting with the panelists, uh, please hold your questions till the house is open and uh, raise your, uh, you know, press the raise your hand button on Zoom and uh, introduce yourself briefly and ask the question or share your comments directly uh, with the panelists. Uh, but in case of any technical glitch because of which you are unable to um, you know, ask the questions directly, then you may please write the questions in the chat box and we will take them up. Uh, so this brings us to the, you know, the structural nitty gritties of the session and now let us uh, formally uh, begin with the panel discussion. Uh, I would like to start with uh, Professor Welsh. <clears throat> Professor Welsh, uh, during the last one year, uh, we have been hearing and reading a lot about several countries in the EU, uh, countries that are, you know, relatively rich, like Germany, France, uh, and also which are not so rich, like, for example, Hungary. Uh, but Austria, uh, despite uh, the solvency as a EU member state, uh, have not really emerged in the centrality of the discussion so far. Now, only recently we learned that, you know, Germany, Austria borders are closed again and how uh, EU Commission is kind of requesting Germany to, you know, to make the border more porous. Uh, but apart from that, not a lot of information we have on Austria so far. Uh, so I would like to first begin with that question that, you know, how has Austria been tackling the COVID situation uh, so far? And why do you think we hear so little uh, about Austria when it comes to the you know, global engagement with the pandemic? Thank you very much. It's a very good question. But first, because of that, what you said, I, I like to say I'm glad that I'm invited here. And I'm also glad to be with uh, friends and colleagues from a Global South Center, because the Global South, I didn't uh, calculate it, but the size of the Global South is very big. And it's not so much around me here in, at my university. So I'm happy to be with you. It's very interesting for me. But what you said, why Austria is not so in the center of the discussion, yeah? And I think for this question, I think you have two questions, but for this question, the answer is very simple, very easy, because we, we, sh we should 
put the, um, the numbers in its place and say, Austria is just, it's, it's a sheer size. Austria has just 10% of the population of Germany, roughly 10%. And 1% of the population of a country such as India, even much less, yeah, less than 1%, less than 10%. So it's a very small country. And why should the media cover Austria so much? So that's the reason, that's a, the one thing, you know, put numbers in its place. And we talked later on with Anand Kumar, India and Austria, this is, I mean, it's a difference. But the other thing, and here you are, I mean, possibly right to ask an Austrian or a person from Austria, it happened as I think you will know, or some of you will know, that this small country, Austria, despite its small size, and particular my place, you have chosen the right region of Austria. There are a number of federal states, and I'm in the state of Tyrol. It's this, this key region. The Olympic Games were offered here, and many people come for skiing. I could show you the, behind the window the, the mountains. They are covered with snow, very nice. So, Olympic region, skiing, tourist resort, you know. Very small, only 600, 7,000 inhabitants. This country became the hotspot, the Corona COVID virus hotspot for whole Europe. Unfortunately, because, it, and it was exactly, I looked this morning to the dates, exactly one year ago, today, one year ago, the first Corona um, patient sick person was discovered in Austria exactly one year ago and the hotspot the origin of that was a small village in Tyrol a, a ski resort it's called Ischgl very famous so they talk about the, Isch, the virus came from Ischgl and it was as you know distributed all over Europe because the tourists thousands of tourists went back home to Nordic countries to everywhere you know so unfortunately we became the most popular hotspot of the virus in Europe. It was very bad. And the second thing, <clears throat> a few weeks ago, the South African virus variant, the next bad luck, was discovered. I mean, is in Europe. And 80% of the European cases, 80% are in my region <laughs> in Tyrol, you know. So it's bad luck in two regards. So, oh my God, such a small country. We would better hide us, but now we are on the stage, you know, because one year ago and now again. And in my opinion, the reaction of the politicians was one year ago too late. You could say, if you are very friendly and kind, you could say, okay, it was new and they could not know and they could not know how deep it goes further on. Okay, but from a scientific point of view, we think different, we think complex, we think when this happens and that happens, we should intervene very fast. And the intervention was not in the first moment. And now again, this is South African virus. I will not go into details, but um, it, it's ongoing since several weeks. You know, people are not allowed to leave the region without a test, without being tested. But only now on from Friday on, several weeks after it started, they will, um, they don't put the village, a specific village in quarantine, but similar like that. So, so the reaction is um, difficult, but it was difficult. There are not so many people. How should they know? And, um, but you have chosen the a hot, a virus hotspot in two versions, the classical virus and the South African version. So, and I think we, we didn't, um, also the, the numbers in Europe, it possibly the first um, measures in April, May was pretty well, but possibly they started too late to, to uh, start the second lockdown in, in autumn. And now the numbers are not so good. Yeah. And we have the South Af African virus um, variant, which is very, uh, it um, spreads faster than the other one, so it's very risky and dangerous. Right. Uh, so such a small country, but it still became the hotspot of uh, pandemic COVID-19. And uh, yet we really don't hear enough about Austria, as you rightly uh, pointed out, Professor Welsh. Uh, turning to Professor Kumar, 
Uh, where do you locate this differential level of global attention during the pandemic? Uh, which is, is it at some level beyond the global north-south divide or wh what is the justification? What is the explanation? In case of uh, Corona pandemic, the north-south divide worked only at the level of measures to offer medical relief and the preventive provisions. There is a very limited social security system in case of a country like India with more than 1300 million people where the medical support system has the ratio of one doctor for more than practically uh, you can say uh, 1,400 people, one doctor for 1,400 people. More facilities in urban India, much more in metro India like Bangalore, Mumbai, Chennai, Delhi, but very little facility in nearly 65% of the country, which is rural India. So that way, the spread of the pandemic had no global variation the way it is spread in America it replicated itself in India. In India, the first case was reported in the last week of January. We were not believing it. And so politicians took their own time and they waited for eight more weeks. So in, by the end of March, we created a national lockdown without much preparation with a near midnight call by the uh, prime minister of the country. In the next four hours, the whole country had to stay where it was. And it also created a crisis of what you call urban migrant workers, because after some time, that is after four to six weeks of lockdown, the survival capacity of urban poor came to its end and people started moving out of their rented places. They had no income. There were free food centers but that was not the solution for family of men, women, old and young, sick and not so well. And then they started moving from major cities to villages. And there was restriction of movement, trains were closed. Of course, planes were not flying and buses were closed. So public transport system had been beyond the poor, but they had to move out. They had nothing to hold them back in the cities. Yes, there was also regional variation, unlike uh, Professor Frank Wells' case of Austria. India is a huge country with nearly 2.4% um, of territory of the whole planet Earth and 18% of the population. So there was a regional variation. Uh, it was much more in Metro India, much more in Northern and Western India. But in total, so far, we have reports of nearly 11 million cases. Uh, infected, and these are reported cases. Not everybody goes to the doctors right. and the hospitals right. because of the fear of being quarantined, the fear of being isolated and stigmatized. So, so far as the reported cases are there, which is the case of under-reporting, we had nearly 11 million cases. Luckily for the country, recovery rate was fairly high. Out of 11 million, 10.7 million recovered. But yes, uh, 15 lakh uh, 72 thousand people. Now we have a situation of uh, near uh, in October, November, we used to have 80,000 cases reporting every day. But for last few weeks, it's less than 20,000 per day. And that's a big relief. Uh, schools are opening gradually. Uh, but public transportation and moving from one city to another city is still very restricted. And as Dr. Frank was reported about new variations in the virus, we also have reported cases. Uh, and this is making us worried of a second round. And they say that the second variation pattern is much more uh, dangerous, much more unmanageable. So let us hope for the best, but at the moment we are waiting for new measures to control and contain. Vaccination is started. 
We are giving priority to the people who are above 60 years of age and is free uh, so far as the ordinary people are concerned. Health workers are being given priority and the sense of panic is gone, but the sense of fear is still very much around. Right. Uh, thank you, Professor Kumar. As uh, you rightly pointed out, you know, like uh, about the internal migrants uh, uh, last year, in fact, when the lockdown happened, and actually in uh, some of our previous sessions also, we have engaged very extensively, uh, you know, on, on, on the plights of the internal migrants in India and how, uh, you know, that, that also got global attention. Uh, just uh, moving to Professor Welsh now, uh, since we are talking about the migrants, uh, the internal migrants in India, I'm just uh, wondering that, you know, Austria, as you remember, state uh, has a growing percentage of, in, uh, you know, like migrant population from global South countries. Uh, so how are they negotiating with this entire pandemic situation for the past one year? And, uh, you know, how is the communication between the Austrian government and uh, its migrants uh, so far, how, this, how, how that has been in terms of sharing information regarding the pandemic, regarding the healthcare uh, facilities. It's very good and very important because I think um, these people, but uh, in my opinion, even all kind of people are not so much covered in the media. Uh, we see about representatives of the economy, this is very important in, in my region, uh, tourist industry, they are covered in media every day, but people, how they cope with it, this we don't know. And also what Anand explained about these workers in, in India, we, I, don't, I can't read uh, anywhere about it. You know? So I think it's very important to bring this um, to the discussion or to learn, I will, I'm eager to learn about it. Here in, in Innsbruck, in my city, in my region, I asked um, people who work with migrants, you know, because, um, some former graduate students who are working as social workers. So I contacted them, I asked people and they tell me the following, how do they cope with? <clears throat> uh, but uh, unlike your question, you asked about people from the global south, but I unfortunately I have to disappoint you because the percentage of foreigners in Austria is relatively high, 70%, but the percentage from the global south First, we don't know where migrants, I mean, uh, I, I cannot talk about this specific group of migrants, I can only talk about migrants as such, but Global South is a small portion, yeah. so <clears throat> very small. But nevertheless, how do migrants and um, people who are refugees cope with it in Innsbruck? And <clears throat> I was informed that for them, they, they understand it as, as all other Innsbruck people are, as there's no problem, you know, they understand all that and they accept the rules, they, they wear masks, so it's the same, it's nothing special, you know, they negotiate with the situation as all of us also do, you know, because they live here, they make experience here, they are involved in practices, so it's the same. Problems arise in regard of, or problems are reported to me regarding homeschooling. Now, this is difficult because all school pupils are sent home and it's just, we suppose that phew, they get a letter or an email, what they should do, parents should do, but how can they cope with the situation? This is very difficult. This is, uh, also the difficulty is a homeschooling as people, as um, social workers told me, that's a difficulty. And your second question is, this is more practical, you know? And the second question, how does the government uh, cope with the migrants, how is sharing information. And of course, a thing which is not covered in the media, I, I, I read every day and I, I read about COVID virus every day, but this problem was not, is not mentioned to, or in, I'm not informed about the problem in the media, although it's crucial and this is language. Of course, language matters. It's the first thing. I mean, there are many important things, financial things and this and that and accommodation, but Language, very simple for, for me as a local, it's a local language, it doesn't matter, but here language matters. And, but I'm informed <clears throat> there are many uh, non-governmental organizations on the one hand, but also um, it's not a state organization, but financed by the state and close to the government. There are organizations and they are providing translations into many languages. 
Yeah, so this is very important. And the city of Vienna, which is very big, it's two million, they have also a website uh, offered in several languages. So the language problem is tackled and these things exist, translations exist, and there also exists many podcasts. And I, I know from the people, they download podcasts. They, I mean, I did not know about that, but of course people, when you are a migrant, you know, about, you learn about that because you are involved in a network, you cope with these people, they learn about it very fast. So this works more or less quite well. Yeah? And for, for offer you an example, in Innsbruck, Global South, there's a Somali, from, people from Somalia, Somali Cultural Center. And there was a cluster because there, of course, in a center, people meet and there was a cluster of the virus. And in this center, the, there exist translations in the Somali language, of course, which is a very small community, but I mean, there, there are translations and these things exist because the civil society is there and there are these organizations that support people, then the net network is there. This, this is what I can, report to your question. Right. No, interestingly, you point out, um, you know, about uh, how translation plays a big role in terms of communication. And that also, I think, somewhere answers the migrant question, uh, you know, that, you know, if as a migrant, if you have some translation possibilities of uh, just, you know, the, the manuals into your own mm -hmm. language or a language that you speak, then, you know, your entire experience of negotiating with the pandemic is uh, maybe more better or more healing. Uh, thank you. And uh, I'm now moving to uh, Professor Kumar, um, just talking about the same discourse of communication between the people and the government in terms of pandemic information. And uh, as Professor Welsh pointed out, the question of you know, the, the context of translating uh, into the language that people understand. And so putting this in the Indian context, like you know, there are so many languages are spoken in India. Uh, and already, you know, we have uh, learned so much about how the healthcare system is very fragile in the country, and there are so so many social inequalities, as you know, as significant social categories in the country. How does India, uh, you know, like fare in this context? Do you think that you know India has a robust communication system between its people and its government? Well, in case of India, there was a very uh, aggressive use of mass media, public media, uh, from television to print media, then billboards uh, in various languages all over the country. There was round the clock uh, use of social media. Some websites were created for those who could get connected. And as you know, 35% of India is now digitally connected. And there was use of uh, multimedia system for communication. But as you know, uh, in such situations, rumors move faster than the uh, governments uh, or scientists uh, reports. So of course, it was a very exaggerated uh, reporting. And there was a big gap between the government position, government figures, and the believed figures. Uh, actually, it created so much of stress that there was loss of togetherness. There was loss of link between the state and the people, which was already very thin in terms of the health facilities. Uh, our health system has been privatized by and large in the last 30 years. And uh, there has been a very thin line of government connect on health front. So uh, private doctors and private hospitals were supposed to be the first base for offering support and most of them closed down because they had no clue how to handle it except to say no to the patients. Uh, then there was the problem of testing and rumors were there about testing facilities also. But I must say that uh, to be fair to the government of the day, uh, the prime minister and the health minister, and then of course the state chief minister, we are a federal country, a unitary federation. Uh, and they were there practically every third or fifth day reporting in positive ways, but as on the ground, realities were not matching. So there was a legitimacy problem in government presentation of the scenario. There was certainly 
very quick engagement of the civil society, particularly younger people through social media, and they made effective use of neighborhood connect, particularly in urban and metro India. Rural India was left uh, to rumors and official bulletins on radio and television, and radio has 99% coverage. Television has nearly 85% coverage. So you must believe that government presentation of the situation was known to most of the people, but there was certainly a counter news system also, which was basically rooted in fear-based rumors, exaggerated positions, and a lot of misuse of the problem by shopkeepers. So for example, sanitizers, they were selling like crazy. Uh, masks, in the beginning, first month, we had shortage of masks. We had really very limited capacity of testing. So yes, in the first go, that is in last 11 months between March and February now, you can say that first three to four months were traumatizing, mere helplessness, praying, Actually, on one of the occasions, even the government is sponsored, clapping publicly on a certain hour of the afternoon. So millions of people were clapping and banging their vessels with the hope that this will scare away the virus. So we, we did many funny things collectively as a nation, but gradually things settled down because when we looked around in our neighborhoods, we realized that it was not spreading like a wildfire. And then there was more and more and more dependence on doctor's reports. All India Institute of Medical Science, Indian Medical Council, they were found to be more trustworthy because they were speaking from scientific angle. You know that at that time, there was also a global war of half-truths. America was speaking in many voices. Europe was much more stable and together like Germany or England or France. But between Mr. Trump and the scientific community, between various mayors of various American cities, we had a mixed situation. So in case of India, there were three important points in communication system. One, information flow was consistent uh, with the government being very proactive and a multimedia system was put in operation. Number two, gradually politicians gave way to scientists whose voice was much more believable, much more understandable. And third, there was continuity of rumor system because of the gaps between say radio, television, newspaper and social media. Right. Uh Interesting uh, uh, to, li to listen to uh, both of you, Professor Kumar and uh, Professor Welsh, because you know when it comes to the communication system, uh, the parameters are so different, uh, you know, across the world, and uh, the essential services in terms of communication system, you know, the parameters and the uh, components, the essential components, really vary across uh, the big spectrum. Uh, I now have a common question uh, for you both. Uh, this pandemic has uh, significantly altered the various ways in we, you know, in which we live and we travel, we consume, etc. And uh, it has impacted the grand flow of people, things, finances, uh, and it is far from being over, as you know, the virus is constantly mutating, and and we just discussed that. So, in uh, some of our earlier sessions, uh, for example, scholar like uh, Nina Glickschiller, she maintained that, you know, this pandemic is, is going to be a game changer for the entire world. And again, uh, Peter van der Weer, on the other hand, uh, uh, he maintains that he uh, really doesn't think that, you know, the pandemic will have any significant impact, any lasting impact on global flows of things. So keeping all these various possibilities in mind, uh, what is your opinion? Uh, how is the post-pandemic situation going to look like for the global South at large? Uh, Professor Welsh, uh, let us hear from you first. Yeah, you're muted. Uh, yeah. yeah. You want I'm me sorry. to go first? Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I had to Amrita. switch on. Yeah, yeah. Let, let's begin with Professor Welsh and then we'll come okay. to Professor Kumar. I was muted. Um, 
um, I, I, as a sociologist, I think I don't, okay. I don't believe in history that history is an automatic process. So I think history is open, yeah, because my feeling tells me uh, or brings me to a more pessimistic answer. Therefore, I start with a more positive one. You know, I start positive and then I uh, smoothly change into more pessimistic picture. Picture. But what is the positive thing? Um, will the post-pandemic situation is your question going to look? How will it look like uh, for the global south at large? You know, um, I think I don't believe like your guest professor Nina Schiller, uh, Vic Schiller. I don't believe in a game changer. I believe in an eye-opener. I think this, the pandemic is a, could be an eye-opener. Why? Because as a sociologist, I like to study uh, the organization of all that, not just the numbers, 7% uh, got vaccinated and this and that, and are they doing good and bad and deaths, you know, but how is it organized? How is the healthcare system organized? How we are the economies organized? How do they, are they balanced? And so these things, yeah. And usually these things are hidden and because of the pandemic, we should discuss these things and it could be, so it could be an eye opener. And then when people see this, possibly they see the inequality, they see the degree of injustice, the unfairness in the world, possibly they, uh, they intervene, they join forces, they collaborate, they organize themselves and they make the world a better place. You know, it could happen. So it could be an eye opener. But how does it look for the global South at large? Yeah. This morning, I read in my newspaper that the Western African state of Ghana received exactly yesterday 600,000 uh, vaccination boxes. Sounds big, but it's small. Yeah? And the plan is that the, the less rich countries of the world, including Ghana, and it was the first one that got the um, vaccination. It's a United Nations program that buys these vaccination boxes and brings them to these countries. The plan is that they are, that they are vaccinated in summer, that 3% of people will be vaccinated. At the moment, 0%, but in summer, 3%. In Germany and Austria, they are planning 100%, which means 60 or 70% will be vaccinated in summer. So I see a huge discrepancy between the North and Western countries and the global South. The United Nations, they buy some vaccination boxes, they bring them there, which is very good, but the numbers are, first, it's much slower and it's much less. Yeah? In, in Morocco, the best uh, portion is in Morocco, the North African state, there's 1% is vaccinated. In Israel, top world leading country, 52%. The best one in Europe is Serbia, 12%. Africa, Morocco, 1%. So, I see a discrepancy. And of course, the eye opener is, we get aware about this. We see that the world is not just values, uh, global community. Um, we, are, we see the, the huge inequality in the world, of course. But we also see and we learn from this small virus that the world is globalized, whether we like it or not, it's globalized. The virus came from China, it's here, it's, it's distributed from my small region to Europe. So we are connected. And we see every day in the media that we share the same pandemic situation in all countries. People need measures, they need healthcare. So we, we live in the same world. This is also, it's um, more clear and more obvious than ever before. So if I should say one further word, my, but I, I will keep it short, you know. I think <clears throat> the, how is the globe organized? You know, how is the governance organized globally in most of the countries? I think there's a global neoliberal um, organization of our practices. And this means that in short, responsibilities of the community are delegated to individuals, to individual people, usually. And this means we no longer support the poor, the marginalized, uh, the farmers in India, we just say, mm, care for yourself. And this is very bad in the pandemic situation. And now the pandemic is the eye opener because in the pandemic, the state has to come in. The state cannot 
poorly delegate as before. Before the state tried, uh, I mean, the forces in the state tried to delegate everything. They say, uh, oh, we can't help, help yourself, you know, do a better education, go for studying in Harvard, you know, all these things. But now it's no longer possible. Even the, um, the neoclassic ec economics and all, all people uh, call for the state and they say the state should uh, come in, intervene, whatever it takes, you know, should take money in, in hand and offer credits. And of course, the state must do everything. So people could um, develop demands towards the state, you know, and what, how will the state cope with that in future? Now he intervenes, she intervenes, or it intervenes and helps out whatever it takes. And now the question is, will the state further on be under our demand and uh, develop the healthcare system everywhere, develop uh, balanced economies between the continents, between the countries, even in Europe, there's a strong uh, imbalance between countries, very bad for the European uh, economic system. Um, or will we fall back to the status as it was before? You know, and of course there are strong forces that we, it seems it will be the same again, you know, but it could operate as an eye opener and it depends on the the coming months and how, how people consider this and how we discuss it and what will happen. So this is my end. Right. Interesting, interesting point you raised that neoliberal organization of practices that no longer supports communities, but are dangerously selfish. And that is where the responsibility of, st of the state lies, you know, to develop the economy and the healthcare and uh, mm -hmm. address those uh, challenges. Uh, Professor Kumar, what is your uh, take on this? How, how do you respond to that? Well, in this of India, which is uh, nearly one sixth of human family situation, we have a few changes already in our collective identity and consciousness. But Indian case remains to be an example of continuity and change. A few things will continue no matter what. And a few things will change no matter what. For example, the gap between the rich and the poor and their survival strategies are going to be more remarkably different than before. So that is going to change. The class barriers are going to become much more uh, higher. On the other hand, what is going to change is the realiz realization of interrelatedness. We may not like each other in terms of classes, caste, religion, but you never know. You will be influenced by what is happening with the shopkeeper or a vendor or an auto rickshaw driver. So you better watch out for a collective hygiene, collective cleanliness, collective defense system. Then second thing which is going to happen, or which is already in the making, is disbelief about the morality of market. We have realized that market is not at all moral it is not at all responsible, accountable. State is much more dependable, though state has its own mechanism, problems, delivery system, loopholes, leakages. But in a democracy, state is still approachable by the people. You can ask the minister, but you cannot ask the president of the local chamber of commerce. You cannot ask the shopkeeper for their meal or a private hospital di director. You can ask a government hospital director Third thing is right to health is going to change forever. Right to health was on the margin. Idea of health and health related cautions was much more like a European privilege. Europeans are supposed to be much more health conscious than the Indians. We thought, oh, it's not a big problem. If we become sick, we will go to the doctor and doctor will help us and we will be back again into our normal life. But now immunity system, your capacity to have resistance your lung power, your nutrition level. These are things which are going to become much more important, which is an individual agency. So importance of individuals, self-consciousness and self-care is now more important than ever before. Another thing which has happened unknowingly is the problem of age or advantage of age. We have been told again and again, again in last 11 months that people below 16 and people above 60 are much more vulnerable. Young people have less fertility rate. 
so to be young and to be old has become more discountable and that is a serious problem for a country like india where rights of the children and rights of the aged people important is social distancing versus physical distancing medical advice has been to maintain medical physical distancing but india a country with has history of untouchability caste distances many other things is going to lapse into social distancing also we have been already very aware of the problem of touch physical proximity intimacy now it is going to be scientifically proven that please keep distance so that social density of our being is going to be uh, written all over till a whole generation is again convinced about the lack of any problem in getting closer to each other being sharing and being caring bottom line of the whole story is that primary group life that is family kinship community network have become more active more meaningful and the neo liberal consumerist way of life where market and money were two defining principles of our capacity our capabilities are proving to be devalued so let me conclude by saying that community has bounced back religions have emerged like markets of very low consequence except for few religions like sikhism there was no community kitchen by temples or right. mosque or churches and there was also a zone of silence when we were considering how to help the underprivileged there was not much mobilization through religious channels they were mobilizing a lot of money for church and temple and mosque but not for the poor and the underprivileged so this is a time of renegotiating our understanding of various institutions agencies and recognizing primacy of health and significance of your immediate social bonds and to revisit them and strengthen them because government may fail market has failed private hospitals have already become this disappointment but your neighbor may rally together your relations your brothers sisters cousins aunts uncles they may be little more responsive than the whole big world of 7.5 billion people thank you uh, <clears throat> thank you so much professor kumar uh, for for this uh, perspective and uh, i thank you both uh, for for this really interesting and critical discussion uh we will open the house uh, just before that i'll take a minute uh to just you know uh wrap up just uh what we were talking about so far uh i think what emerges uh, we talked about several things but what i find very uh realistic as as a mechanism is to look at the you know the way the government and people communicate with each other in fact the very basis of communication as professor kumar was also talking about you know like how markets are failing the state might still not function but the communities uh will uh, still have to hold on to each other so the very fundamental thing about a pandemic is you know how communication takes place uh between uh people between the state and the people and of course uh the vagaries of the market will always be there but also certain level of communication when the vaccination is happening how the market how the uh global um you know uh pharmaceutical companies communicate to us about the vaccine in fact a lot of people uh all across the world are really not very happy with the way their governments are uh you know rolling out the vaccination the inoculation process so uh, people also claim that you know they have little information very little information on the benefits and the dangers of the vaccine so they are not really confident as to the government's decision whether they should get vaccinated or not so the channel and the pattern of communication uh from a micro to a macro level i think is a key component in this context another relevant issue here is uh, for imagining the future in a post pandemic situation and especially for the global south because you know the title we have today is like an re reimagining or imagining a global south future 
uh, so for imagining a post pandemic global south future where emigration and outer outer migration basically is an everyday reality for a lot of us uh, we may need to reimagine the implications of the nation state first uh, in in the past one year we have constantly been reminded that you know despite all the global flows of things and movements of people borders are not uh, you know they 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 are not irrelevant at all they they have not ceased to matter in fact you know they matter even more uh, than ever perhaps and so from that perspective uh, movements the movements of a virus have come to actually dominate our imaginations and our fears uh, in such a way that it kind of forces us to consider uh, mobility of people not just as exchange of cultures finances or services but mobility of people as mobility of diseases too and this pandemic has taught us already that you know exponential increase in mobility of people is directly proportional to the threat of exponential spread of a disease that no border in the world can control so consequently uh, one wonders that are we reaching a uh, time and space for rethinking the existing definition of nation state and explore new parameters for attributing the very idea of nation state in a post pandemic future so with this question i'll i'll stop here and let us now open the house and invite our listeners to join us in the conversation <laughs>